And the essential feminine pathology Freud mapped out, it's the Oedipal mother. And the Oedipal mother is the mother that gets too close to her children, right? And intermingles herself with them to too great a degree that in her attempts to protect them, undermines them fatally. And so there's a classic representation of the feminine in the West and the classic representation is Mary. And here, here's one of the representations, it's lovely and it, it's derived at least in part from the story of Mary and the snake in the Garden of Eden. And so Mary has her foot on a serpent and she's holding Christ off to the side like this. Well, that's exactly what mothers have always done. It's a biological portrait of human women as they hold their infants out of the reach of the terrible serpentine predator. Obviously, that's what we do. Well, that's fine, but adults aren't infants and neither are children. And if you treat them like they are, you undermine them. You, 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 you pathologize them. You turn them into old infants. That's an ugly thing. And that's the Freudian nightmare. You know, and, and this happens in therapy very frequently. I mean, you can be tangled into a terrible relationship with your father. That's often either because he was absent, abusive, or tyrannical, something like that. But the, the, the standard pathology with mom is, she did everything for you. Well, what's left for you to do? Nothing, including never leaving. And that's the motivation, you know, for the woman who's nothing but protective mother. There's no role outside of nurturing, of nurturing, nurturing, of nurturant of infants, of nurturer of infants. Well, you just keep them infants. They'll never leave. They might kill you one night in your sleep, but they'll never leave. Sure, sure. I mean, it's so comical watching the feminists, postmodernists in particular, rattle on about the absence of gender reality and act out the archetypal devouring mother at exactly the same time. For them, the world is divided into predators and infants. And the predators are evil and need to be stopped, and the infants need to be cared for. Well, that's what the mother does. But adults are not infants. And all you do is destroy them when you treat them that way, especially when they're adolescents and just starting to develop. You know, there's, there's a rule that I attempted to abide by when I had small children, and the rule was, don't do anything for your children that they can do themselves. And it's annoying, that rule, because <clears throat> it takes you like 15 seconds to, to dress a two-year-old, but if you let the two-year-old dress himself, it's like it's 15 minutes or 20 minutes or half an hour. You chase them around the house. But if you let them learn to dress themselves, then you don't have to dress themselves any, dress them anymore, and they can do it. And you do that with setting the table, and you do that with everything. It's like, no, it's okay, you do that now. Well, I care for you so much, let me do that for you. It's like, I don't care for you at all when I say that. I don't care for you at all. I'm gonna stop doing everything I possibly can for you as rapidly as I possibly can. Say, well, that's great. That's how you work in an old age home. Do not do anything for the inhabitants that they can do themselves because you rob them of the last vestiges of their independence, right? It's what you do when you're a manager. If you're a good manager, you make yourself superfluous by extending autonomy and independence to the people that you manage so that they can take over the whole job. You don't do that by doing everything for people. And you certainly don't do that by dividing the world archetypally and uncritically into predators, those who have more, and victims, infants, those who have nothing, and acting like all you can ever do is protect them. You don't protect, first of all, you can't protect people. You can only make them strong. That's it, you cannot protect them. You can make them strong, and then they can protect themselves. But then they don't need you. Right, and there's the underground pathological element of the devouring mother. It's like, never leave me, here's the deal. I'll do everything for you. You just never leave. Right, that's sleeping with your mother. Right, that's the Freudian nightmare, right? You don't invite your child into your bed, right? You distinguish between them and you. You distinguish between them and your husband and you facilitate their independence. A part of the reason why it's useful to have a mother and a father is because 
the mother has to fall insanely in love with the infant or she'd throw it out the window, right? Because they're, they're insanely demanding and they're always right, right? Because the right way to treat an infant, especially before nine months is, I'll do everything for you and you're always right and your needs take priority over everyone's, everyone else's and anybody that threatens you is terrible. Exactly right. But after, you know, once the kid is ambulatory and starting to be independent, that's the wrong attitude. The attitude then is, you know, get the hell on with it. And men who are less prone to negative emotion and less compassionate are much better at fostering that kind of independence. And so it's usually then when they step into the family and start playing with the kids, rough and tumble play, and pushing them forward and saying, you know, get on with it, you can do it, you can do it. And it's very hard for a mother to play both those roles because she has to fall so in love with her infant that it's difficult for her to be like universal caregiver and disciplinarian at the same time. You know, because the roles are, the roles run contrary to one another. And so now women have entered the political sphere, right, en masse. And so they're going to bring their essential nature with them, all the while saying there's no such thing as essential nature. It's like, yeah, there is.